All right. Uh, so um, hope everyone had a good break. Um, so uh, I um, I tried to answer uh, at least a few of the the questions in the Q and A uh, sort of typing answers. Um, so uh, hopefully your question got answered. There are still many great questions that I didn't have a chance to answer. Um, one thing I just want to flag before I get started. I don't know if I, ever, I mentioned this at the beginning. I, I intended to, um, but I, I I can't remember if I did. Um, I do have a uh, difference in differences resources page on my website uh, that I just wanted to flag. Um, and uh, so that has links to our review paper. Uh, it has links to the slides from my uh, course that I teach through uh, mixtape sessions where uh, kind of the material today is sort of based on, on that material, but that's a full day course and this is a half day course. Um, so there's a bunch of other good stuff that I won't have a time to talk about today, such as my slides on staggered, staggered treatment timing and stuff like that. Um, so you can view that there. Um, there are also some other resources, like there's a link to my uh, Difference and Differences review paper, uh, which one thing I want to flag about that is that it has uh, uh, two kind of tables that may be of interest. Uh, one table is about, um, uh, it's a, a checklist for practitioners. So it goes through uh, several different things that you might want to think about uh, and kind of points you to different sections of the paper, uh, depending on uh, kind of what uh, scenario that you're in. Uh, and so that might be kind of a useful thing to uh, keep in mind. Uh, and then the, uh, the second thing that uh, I have in there uh, is uh, kind of a table of uh, different diff packages in R and Stata. Um, so uh, those are all on my uh, different diff resources page on my website, the review paper, the links to my teaching slides. I think there are also some links to some videos of, of courses like this one that I've done. Um, and so uh, if uh, there's stuff that I haven't covered here, and, and uh, there there will be plenty of stuff that I haven't covered here. Um, a lot of that stuff can be found on that uh, DID resources page. Um, so uh, definitely uh, encourage uh, you to check that out. Um, I see some people say they couldn't find my website on Google. Um, if you Google Jonathan Roth Brown University, I think you should get there. Uh, if not, jonathandroth.com. Uh, should get you there. Uh, so hopefully uh, you can find my website. Uh, I think um, we can also send out the link uh, if people are having trouble finding it, but but hopefully uh, that won't be an issue. All right. So uh, let me uh, kind of uh, just push on a little bit here. Um, so um, as we talked about testing for pre-existing trends is a natural way to assess the plausibility of the parallel trends assumption. Um, there's this intuitive reasoning. If the groups looked parallel beforehand, uh, it's more likely they would have continued to be parallel uh, unless there were some you know, simultaneous confounding changes that just cropped up right around the time of the treatment. Uh, if they were not parallel beforehand, it's sort of a little bit implausible to think that they would have magically started being parallel afterwards if the, the treatment hadn't occurred. Um, so uh, pretrends provide us with a lot of information, uh, but they also have some limitations. Uh, and uh, so uh, what I wanna uh, talk about now is what are those limitations uh, and then uh, what can we do about them? All right. So uh, to give you an overview of uh, limitations, uh, as I mentioned, one limitation is that parallel pretrends, even if we knew we had infinite data. We knew the two groups were exactly parallel beforehand. There's some settings where that wouldn't necessarily imply that they were would have been parallel afterwards if the treatment hadn't occurred. Uh, so one example, which I've alluded to a couple of times, but is uh, worth repeating, is suppose there's some other policy change that happens at the same time. We increase the minimum wage at the same time that we, uh, you know, increase the generosity of unemployment insurance. Well, uh, you know. The effect of that UI reform is not going to show up in the pretrends because it didn't exist, right? And so we're not going to be able to decouple the effect of the UI reform with the effect of the minimum wage. Uh, so that could be a setting where, you know, even if the minimum wage reform hadn't occurred, since the UI reform happened at the same time, the groups might not have been parallel afterwards, even if they were uh, parallel before. Uh, a kind of related scenario where the groups could be parallel beforehand, but not afterwards is suppose the treatment and the control group are differentially exposed to economic shocks. But in the you know, couple of periods we have beforehand, there weren't really changes in the macroeconomy. This was a calm period in terms of the macroeconomy, but
But then say there was a recession right around the time of our treatment. So it could be the groups were parallel because there weren't really any economic shocks beforehand. But even if the treatment hadn't occurred, they would have diverged owing to these uh, macroeconomic shocks at around the same time as our, our treatment happened. Right? So one caveat is that parallel pretrends doesn't necessarily imply parallel uh, sort of counterfactual uh, post-treatment trends. All right. So that's one issue. Oh, did my slides just disappeared. I stopped screen sharing. Well, I didn't intend to do that. Let me try again. All right, uh, sorry about that. All right, so uh, now that we're back online, all right, so so one concern is parallel pretrends doesn't necessarily imply counterfactual post-treatment trends for these reasons that I just discussed. Uh, but in many economics contexts, we may know about the types of things we might be worried about and think that probably parallel pretrends would imply parallel counterfactual trends. So if we're worried about different macroeconomic factors and there was a lot of macroeconomic variation beforehand, then we sort of think that the pretrends are probably informative about the counterfactual post-treatment trends. Uh, so uh, are we okay in that context? Well, we still might have an issue for a couple of reasons. One issue is that the pretrends test may have low power. So in practice, we don't observe infinite data. And so there's gonna be some statistical noise in our estimates. And so even if the true pretrends are non-zero, we may fail to detect it statistically in the sense that we can't reject the null hypothesis that uh, the pretrends were exactly the same. Um, so uh, that's uh, one issue that I'll talk a lot more about uh, in the coming slides. Uh, and then a second issue that I'll talk about after I talk about low power uh, is issues related to uh, what's called pretesting bias. So intuitively, if we only analyze cases where we don't have a statistically significant pretrend, then this is gonna introduce some form of selection bias, right? We're only analyzing our data in a particular setting. We're gonna see a selected sample from this data generating process. Uh, and it turns out that that can introduce uh, some additional issues, which in some cases uh, can uh, make things worse. Uh, so uh, hopefully the point about parallel pretrends doesn't necessarily imply parallel uh, counterfactual trends is clear. Uh, and now let me elaborate a little bit more on what I mean by low power and, and pretesting issues. Okay. Uh, and then uh, a final issue uh, that I, I haven't talked about, uh, but I, I will when we get to the solutions, uh, is that uh, if we fail the pretest, so we see the groups were not really moving in parallel beforehand, then we know that probably the parallel trends assumption doesn't hold exactly, but we might not want to give up, right? So the, the standard approach says, look, were the groups moving in parallel beforehand? If not, you you have some problem, but you know we may still want to write a paper, especially if we don't have tenure yet, right? So we probably still want to be able to say something about what's the effect of this policy. And we might think that even if the groups are not moving in parallel beforehand, if they're kind of close to parallel, at least relative to the differences afterwards, we might think that the violation of parallel trends is relatively small. So we'd still like to be able to say something, uh, but sort of the current approach doesn't really tell us what we should do in that case. We sort of reject parallel pretrends, but we'd like to be able to say something. Right. Um, so uh, let me elaborate a little bit more on these issues, starting with uh, kind of the issue of low power. Okay. All right, so uh, to uh, kind of make very clear the issue of low power, uh, I want to start by uh, sort of illustrating these issues in the context of a particular paper. Uh, this is a paper by He and Wong, uh, but I just want to say at the outset that this is not just trying to pick on this one paper. Uh, I'll uh, talk a little bit later about some more systematic evidence that I have in my AR Insights paper, uh, where I uh, sort of do power calculations uh, in kind of a, a survey of recent papers in the AER and AJ journals. Uh, so this is kind of a representative example of kind of uh, some, a problem that exists in this literature as opposed to, to trying to pick on this particular paper. But I think just pedagogically, it's easier to kind of think about these issues in the context of a particular paper rather than in the context of a uh, you know, abstract uh, econometric setting. 
All right, so I'm going to think about this paper by He and Wong. Uh, they study uh, the causal effect of a program in China that uh, placed college graduates as village officials. So these are like rural uh, areas in China, uh, and they're uh, bringing in uh, kind of a, a more educated than the norm person uh, to uh, work as a village official. And they're interested in things like how does having this more educated village official who knows the uh, sort of rules of the government a little bit better, how does that affect things like the fraction of people in the population who receive subsidies from the, the government, right? And so this is, uh, to first order, this is a non-staggered difference in differences. There are like a handful of units that get the treatment at a weird time, but roughly speaking, this is a, a non-staggered difference in differences. And, and so what they're gonna do is basically they're gonna normalize the difference between the treated and the control groups in the period before treatment, which they call minus one uh, to zero, that's the intersection of these dotted lines here. And so then uh, this uh, triangle here at period zero is the diff and diff between period zero, that's the first period where the, the treatment occurred relative to period minus one. So we're gonna take the change uh, in the outcome for the treated villages relative to the untreated villages between minus one and zero. We're gonna subtract off the, um, uh, uh, difference in the in the pretreatment period. So this is like our this first thing here at period zero corresponds to just that two period diff and diff estimate that we talked about earlier in the canonical model between the period before uh, these village officials were instated and the period afterwards. And then this is an event study, so uh, minus two sort of does the same thing, but in reverse. So this is looking at the change between period minus two and period minus one, so between the, the two periods right before the reform uh, and, and so on and so forth, all right? And formally, these are coefficients from this two-way fixed effects event study. All right, so why did I choose this paper as an illustrative example? Uh, they, one of the reasons is that they have this great quote, which I think nicely summarizes what people uh, have typically done in this literature, at least until a few years ago, uh, when uh, I and, and other people started uh, writing some papers about uh, kind of issues with this approach. So what they write is that the estimated coefficients on the leads of treatment, so they're talking here about these three pretreatment coefficients that are comparing uh, sort of basically running diff and diffs between the eventually treated and the untreated villages in periods before anyone received the treatment. Uh, these are statistically indistinguishable from zero and they therefore conclude that the pretreatment trends and the outcomes in both groups of villages are similar. And so villages without the treatment can serve as a suitable control group for villages with the treatment in the pretreatment period. So we're not gonna find any significant pretrends here, right? And so that gives us some confidence in the parallel trends assumption. And so we're then gonna sort of interpret these post-treatment coefficients as valid estimates of the causal effect of the treatment uh, in the post-treatment period under the parallel trends assumption. Okay. And so uh, this is kind of uh, the type of argument that's typically made in this literature. Uh, and if I could try to put a little bit more statistical structure on what he and Wong are saying here uh, is that uh, if we test the null hypothesis that the true pretrends were exactly parallel in the population that we cared about, that's saying we're gonna test the null hypothesis that these estimated coefficients in the three pretreatment periods uh, are in the population are actually equal to these three green dots at zero. So we wanna test the null hypothesis that parallel trends holds exactly in the pretreatment periods in the population that we care about from which we've gotten uh, a sample. Right? And indeed we cannot rule out that these three estimated coefficients are actually equal to these green dots at conventional level. So if we run that F test, we get a p-value of 0 0.81. So at any conventional uh, confidence level, uh, we cannot rule out that these groups were moving exactly in parallel in the pretreatment periods. And so we can't reject that these groups are in parallel beforehand. If they were parallel before, it seems plausible they would continue to be parallel afterwards. Uh, and so we can't rule out exactly parallel pretrends. So, so that's good. Uh, but kind of the slightly concerning thing here is that well, we can't rule out that these three uh, estimated pretrends coefficients were equal to the green dots, which correspond to no violation of parallel trends. 
But we also can't rule out that they're equal to these red dots that I've drawn here. So I've rigged everything here so that these the null hypothesis that the uh, true coefficients are equal to these red dots is exactly the same as it is for the, the green dots. So it's 0 0.81 when we test the green dots. It's also 0 0.81 when we test these red dots. All right. And so, OK, we can't rule out that the trends were parallel beforehand, but we also can't rule out that there are these red dots. Why is that concerning? Well, these red dots lie on a straight line. That's the way I've uh, rigged it. And they lie on a straight line such that if I extrapolated the straight line, so if the true pretrends were these red dots, the uh, trend for the treated group was just increasing by a constant slope relative to the control group in all of the pretreatment periods. If I then extrapolated that slope, I said, absence the treatments, the increment would have just been the same in every periods. In population, the treated group, if there were no treatment effect, would have just continued on this red line. Uh, and it turns out that the extrapolation of this red line to the post-treatment period actually goes through all of my confidence intervals for estimates of the post-treatment effect, and it's pretty close to a lot of the point estimates. So it's true that I can't rule out exactly zero violations of parallel trends, but I also can't rule out some pre-existing trends that if I continued to extrapolate them would create a bias that's pretty similar to what I estimated. So it could be that the truth is the zero, is that the, the groups were in parallel and they would have continued to be in parallel. Uh, and then these post-treatment coefficients would be valid estimates of the causal effect, which would suggest you know, a positive effect of the treatment. But it could also be that there's no effect of the treatment and these groups were just on a increasing trends of the treatment group relative to the control group. And that's kind of driving everything that's going. And then just to emphasize the point a little bit more, uh, we also can't rule out that uh, the uh, true differences in trends beforehand were these three blue dots. Again, I've rigged everything here so that I get the same p-value for these blue dots. If I test, you know, are these true coefficients the blue dots, I get the same p-value for the green dots or the red dots, I get 0 0.81, so I can't rule out that it's these blue dots. What's the significance of these blue dots? Well, these blue dots lie on a smooth quadratic curve such that if I sort of extrapolated that quadratic curve to the post-treatment period, I would think that there's a bias, but it's actually a negative bias that's of roughly the magnitude uh, of my coefficients, but in the opposite direction. So these estimated coefficients would be too small uh, by a factor of about two. OK, so what I want you to take away from this example is that it's true. We can't reject the zero pretrend, which we think would be good news for the parallel trend assumption. But we also can't reject non-zero pretrends, uh, say a linear one or a quadratic one, that if those non-linear, if those non-zero pretrends sort of continued into the post-treatment period, in this example, those would produce sort of a substantial bias relative to the magnitude of the coefficients that we estimate. So if it were the red line, then our uh, estimated treatment effects would be too large. Uh, if uh, it were the blue line, our estimated treatment effects would be about too small. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, is the common p-value of 0 0.81 across all scenarios a pure coincidence? Uh, this is sort of rigged so that they're all the same here. So I, I chose the slope of the line so that the um, probability I can reject that line is the same as the probability I can reject zero. This is an illustration of things that I sort of can't rule out with exactly the same confidence as the zero, which is the null that I usually test. So thanks for, for clarifying. Um, Rajesh asks, what if the betas were significant in pretreatment periods? Uh, if they were significant, then we would reject that uh, the parallel trends assumption holds in the pretreatment period. So in that case, we would sort of detect the violation of parallel trends. So then we might be skeptical of the, of the design. So that would be a case where the pretrends tests work in the sense that they detect that there's a problem. Uh, as I mentioned, there's still then the question of what do we do? But at least if they were significant, then uh, the data would be telling us that there's likely to be a problem here. Uh, the issue I'm trying to point out here is that if they don't detect a problem, 
typically what people do is they just proceed as if parallel trends holds exactly. But the issue is that uh, while we don't statistically significantly reject that they're zero, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are zero. There are some non-zero violations of parallel trends that we can't statistically significantly reject. And so we might be worried about those violations of parallel trends that we can't reject. So let me just push on a little bit more. Uh, so uh, this, of course, was just one paper. I did some power calculations for one paper. Uh, it turns out that these types of issues apply uh, much more broadly. Uh, so uh, in my AR Insights paper, uh, I sort of have a broad set of simulations and power calculations calibrated uh, to a kind of large sample of, of papers uh, in the AR and AJ journals. Uh, and it turns out that these types of issues of kind of low power against violations of parallel trends that could potentially be very problematic relative to the magnitude of the coefficients that are actually estimated uh, is something that's not just specific to He and Wong, uh, but is an issue that uh, kind of exists more broadly. Uh, I won't have time today to kind of go through all of the exact specifics of uh, those simulations, but if you're interested, you can uh, take a look at that paper. Okay, so one issue is that parallel trends could be violated, uh, but just statistically, we can't reject that, in fact, uh, the trends were uh, parallel beforehand. Uh, so that's uh, low power, which I just talked about. Uh, a second issue, which is slightly more subtle, uh, is uh, distortions from pretesting. Uh, so uh, let me give you a, a, a little bit more detail on what I mean by that. Uh, and then I'll illustrate this with a, a simulation that will hopefully uh, kind of make it, um, that will hopefully uh, make it a little bit clearer. Uh, and so uh, at kind of a high level, uh, what happens is that uh, suppose parallel trends is actually violated. So if I had data on the full population, I would see that parallel trends, you know, before the treatment occurred, the two groups were not really moving uh, in parallel. Uh, but of course, I don't usually have data on the full population, at least if my name's not Raj Chetty. Uh, and so uh, in practice, I have some sample uh, and that may be a statistically noisy sample. and so. Sometimes if parallel trends is violated, I will not find a significant pretrend from, from a statistical perspective, all right? And so if I say what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna proceed with my research design if I don't statistically find a difference in trends uh, before the treatment occurred, uh, then uh, kind of the draws of the data where this happens, where I proceed to analyze my uh, data as if it's causal because I didn't find a statistically significant pretrend, that's gonna be a selective sample from my data generating process, right? Some of the time I'll find a significant one, some of the time I won't, I'm only gonna look at the data as causal when I you know, don't find a statistically significant pretrend. So I'm creating the selection step, All right? Uh, and we know kind of if we analyze selective samples that that can lead to statistical issues. So in this context, uh, this form of selected sample is what's known as a pretest bias. Uh, and it turns out that uh, you can show that in, in uh, somewhat common settings we think for uh, difference of differences that looking at this selected sample leads to problems that can actually in some cases make uh, the uh, issue of violations of parallel trends worse. Okay. So uh, I want to illustrate that to uh, you uh, in um, uh, the context of a sort of uh, very stylized uh, three period difference in differences model. So uh, we talked earlier about a difference in differences model where we only had one pretreatment period. We just had period zero before and period one afterwards. Now I want to think about a, a extension where I now have two periods beforehand. So I've added in a, a period minus one here. So I have period minus one and zero where uh, nobody was treated. And then I have period one where the treated uh, group gets treated. Uh, and so now I can uh, test for pretrends. I can test where the two groups moving in parallel between minus one and zero. All right. To make this uh, um, example, super uh, simple, I'm going to assume that there's actually no causal effect of the treatment, okay? So the Y0s and the Y1s are exactly the same in all the periods, okay? So any estimated treatment effects are just going to be because of bias, all right? And so uh, what we're going to uh, assume in the simulations is that in the population, the treatment group is on a linear trend relative to the control group with some slope uh, delta, I think, in the simulation, actually, delta is equal to three. Okay, so what in particular, what I mean is the control group uh, in each period 
is going to have an expected outcome of zero. The treated group in each period is going to have an expected outcome of delta times t. So it's going to be on an increasing trend. Uh, and as I said, there's no treatment effect here. So the y zeros and the y ones are all the same. Any differences between the groups are just based on some different factors that are increasing linearly for the treated group relative to the control. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate the yit as the group specific mean plus some independent normal noise. Okay. So here's a, a visualization of uh, what this uh, data generating process looks like. Okay. Uh, so if we had data on the population, uh, on the x-axis, I have my three periods. On the y-axis, I have the difference in means between uh, the uh, treated group and the control group in the relevant period. Okay, So if I had data on the full population, I would see that in the period minus 1, the treated group's outcome was three units lower than the control group's outcome on average. At period 0, they were the same. And at period 1, the treated group was above the control group. So we see that the uh, treated group's outcome is increasing linearly relative to the control group's outcome. And remember, there's no treatment effect here. So this is what would have happened without the treatment is the same as what happens with the treatment. Okay. All right. So if I had data on the population, I would see kind of nothing really changes at treatment. There's just a pretrend here and it continues in the post-treatment period. So I would probably conclude that, you know, there's not a lot of evidence that anything really changed at the time of the treatment. It was just that there was this pre-existing trend and it continued. But in practice, I don't get to observe the population. I observe some estimate of the population means. Uh, and um, in the actual exam, the actual statistical estimates I get, I don't actually perfectly estimate the population mean. So I get noisy estimates of the population differences in each period. So uh, I get something that looks like one of these gray lines. So each of these gray lines here, uh, is plotting kind of the uh, difference in each period in simulations from this data generating process uh, where I get noisy estimates of each of these uh, um, of the each of these differences based on my my sim okay and so even though there's this pre-existing difference in trends right the slope of three in some draws of the data I'm not going to find a statistically significant difference in pretrends Right. And so what I've done here is I've highlighted these draws of the data in blue, where I don't find a significant difference between period minus one and zero. Uh, notice that the, the diff and diff between period minus one and zero corresponds to the slope of the line between minus one and zero. Okay. Right. Because the difference in differences or the pre trends estimate is the difference in uh, period zero minus the uh, difference in period minus one. Okay. So the, the slope of this line corresponds to the diff and diff estimate between period minus one and period zero. And so by definition, uh, the cases where I don't find a significant pretrend are ones where that slope is flat, right? So if the slope is relatively flat, the diff and diff between minus one and, and zero is relatively small. And so I don't statistically reject that there were no significant pretrends. Okay. So you see that these blue lines tend to be flatter uh, than uh, the uh, line in the population, the black line, which corresponds to the true difference in trends between period minus one and two. Right. So when I don't reject, I find sort of a, a shallow slope between minus one and zero. How do I get a shallow slope? Well, I tend to get a shallow slope when I underestimate the difference in period zero, the period before the treatment. Right. So you can see here that the differences at period zero these blue dots tend to be below the population difference at period zero. I get measurement error noise in my data at period zero that leads me to underestimate what's the difference at period zero that flattens out this line. And so it leads me to statistically not sort of detect this violation of parallel trends. But then my post-treatment difference in differences estimate is the slope of the line between period zero and period one, right? It's the difference between the groups at period one minus the difference at period zero, that's just the slope of these blue lines between period zero and period one. And so you can see here that since these blue dots tend to be too low at period zero, these 
uh, slopes between period zero and period one for the for the blue lines tend to be pretty steep. And that corresponds to me estimating large difference in differences between period zero and period one. So you can see this here. I've averaged this difference in differences uh, estimate over a million draws, right? So if I look at the population means, if I didn't select on pretrends, on average, I just detect what's true in the population, which is this black line. Treatment group is just increasing linearly relative to the control group. Not much seems to be happening uh, around the time of the treatment. But if I only look at the draws where I don't find a significant pretrend, by construction, the pretreatment difference in differences is relatively small. In this example, it turns out to be 1.4 on average. So if I don't reject uh, parallel trends, on average, I have some slope, but it tends to be smaller than the one in the population. It's only 1.4 rather than three. But then my post-treatment difference in differences estimate, because of this mean reversion type of effect, because I underestimate the difference at period zero, tends to be larger uh, than in the population. So here, it, it uh, on average, is 3.8. So by sort of selecting on not finding a significant pretrend, I get this thing that looks more like a hockey stick, where uh, things are relatively flat before and then uh, different afterwards. So I conclude that there seems to be a treatment effect. It's 3.8 beforehand, and it's only 1.4. Uh, sorry, 3.8 afterwards, only 1.4 beforehand, when in fact the population was a straight line, right? And so this 3.8 that I get afterwards, once I select on not finding a significant pretrend, is actually even worse than what I would have estimated if I just had ignored uh, the pretrends. So of course, this doesn't mean that pretesting always makes things work, but you can sort of see that the issues here, because I have low power, sometimes I don't detect a violation of parallel trends. And then because I'm looking at this selected sample, uh, that can potentially increase the bias that I get in the post-treatment period. Um, so let me just pause there, I'll let that sink in, and I'll look um, at uh, some of the um, uh, questions in the chat. So someone says, what should a good pretrend look like, a precise null? Yeah, so the, the more precise is the zero, the more confidence that should give you about uh, the parallel trends assumption. So a lot of these issues that I'm talking about come up when uh, we're not super sure, uh, is the pretrend zero, or is it uh, you know, something that's non-zero? And so intuitively, what you want is you want your uh, treatment, uh, pretreatment estimates to be precise enough that you can sort of rule out violations of parallel trends that if you did some reasonable extrapolation of them would produce a meaningful bias. Uh, and uh, in the uh, sort of uh, slides to come, I'll talk about uh, my work with the Shesh Ramachin, which provides one way of formalizing what does it mean for uh, sort of the uh, pre-trends estimates to be precise enough relative to the post-treatment estimates for you to be able to say that, uh, you know, the violations of parallel trends would have to be uh, relatively unreasonable uh, in order for me to, to draw some conclusion. So uh, I'll talk a lot more about uh, sort of ways of formalizing what does it mean uh, that there's uh, some uh, kind of precise uh, pre-trends relative to the magnitude of the, the post-treatment estimates. Uh, let me just pick out a couple of other questions. Uh, sorry, I can't get to all of them. Uh, Rajesh asked a clarification here. Um, uh, what is the y-axis, I think, is basically the, the essence of the question. So here the y-axis is the difference in means between uh, the treated and the control group in each period, right? Okay, uh, there are a lot of other great questions. I think in the interest of time, uh, I'm uh, not going to uh, take all of them right now, uh, but uh, many of these uh, you can keep in the back of your mind for when I uh, do sort of the open Q&A uh, towards the, the end of the session. Okay, great. All right, so uh, what I've talked about so far is uh, sort of what are the statistical limitations of pretrends testing? Uh, and uh, we talked basically about three things. So just to recap, 
Uh, the first thing we talked about, uh, actually, I should really have a, a, I guess, a number zero here, which is that parallel pretrends does not imply parallel post trends. Right, so uh, I, I should have really had this in the slide here. We talked about, you know, even if I knew in the population the groups were parallel beforehand, it's possible that they wouldn't have been parallel afterwards because of, say, some policy change that happened at the same time as the one that we care about, say, a change to unemployment insurance at the same time as the change to minimum wage. If we're interested in the minimum wage, uh, that could be confounded by the simultaneous um, uh, impact of the unemployment insurance. All right. So even if we had data on the full population, it could be that uh, parallel pretrends doesn't imply uh, parallel post trends, which is what we need. Um, but even if we were willing to rule that out, uh, there's another issue which we talked about, which is low power. That is just because we don't find a significant pretrend, that doesn't mean that there isn't some uh, non-zero pretrend because uh, we sort of have statistical noise in our data. So we may not always detect violations of parallel trends when they exist. Uh, we then also talked about issues related to pretesting. So there's some selection bias. If I only analyze the data when the pretrends look good, then I'm sort of looking at selective draws from my DGP. We saw how that can kind of potentially lead to misleading conclusions where when parallel trends is violated, uh, we sort of, if we just look at cases where the pretrends look good, uh, we'll see the pretrends look pretty good. Uh, and there seems to be an effect afterwards uh, that uh, sort of could be the statistical artifact of having selected on the, on the test for parallel trends. Uh, and then the third issue, which I, I think I alluded to briefly, but we haven't talked a lot about, is sometimes we do reject the pretrends test, especially if we have really good power. You know, In non-experimental settings, it's rare that we think the groups would have had exactly the same trends before the treatment occurs. But you know, if we find a violation of parallel trends that's statistically significant, what do we do? Uh, we might want to argue that the uh, violation is relatively small relative to what we uh, estimated. And so hopefully we could still say something, uh, but sort of the usual approach of let's just test for a significant pretrend doesn't really tell us much about what we should do uh, in that latter case. Uh, Mukesh asks a clarification, which is uh, exactly right. So should it be uh, imply counterfactual post-treatment trends, right? So I, I'm talking about All right, so I'm talking, would they have been parallel after the date of the treatment if the treatment hadn't occurred? Great clarification, thanks. Uh, someone says they can't see the questions that other people are asking. Um, is it possible for us to have the Q&A uh, sort of public for everyone to see? Um, I don't know, Paul, if, if or Zach, if, if that's possible, um, but that, you know, I, if, if it is possible, I, uh, it sounds uh, good to do to me, but uh, if not, uh, I believe after the, the um, I believe after the, the workshop, the Q&A uh, will be recorded. Um, so uh, hopefully if you can't see it now, you can, you can see it later if you, if you come back to this. All right, great. Okay. All right, so um, what can we do about uh, these sort of statistical limitations of uh, pretrans testing? Um, I guess in my work, uh, I've uh, proposed two types of solutions. Uh, I like the second one better than the first one. And so today I'm gonna uh, talk mainly about the second one, um, but uh, let me just kind of uh, briefly talk about the, the first one uh, as well. Uh, so one thing that we can do is we can run some diagnostics of power calculations and distortions from pretesting. So uh, I've talked a lot about issues that mainly are problematic in cases where we don't have a lot of power to detect the relevant violations of parallel trends. And so one can do an exercise similar to the exercises that I did for, say, the He and Wong paper, where one says, you know, how big a violation of parallel trends would I be likely uh, to detect using a pretest? Uh, to do that, I, of course, have to say what the violations of parallel trends look like. So I have to say, do they look, do I think they're going to look linear? Do I think they're going to look quadratic? Do I think they're going to look something different? 
Uh, but if you specify what types of violations of parallel trends am I trying to detect, you can say what would be the probability that I would detect such a violation if it did in fact exist. Uh, and so uh, the pre-trends package that I uh, uh, have developed in, in R and Stata uh, helps you run those types of diagnostics. So you can try and uh, do some power calculations to say, you know, how likely am I to detect some violation of parallel trends? Um, I think that's an improvement on the, on the common practice because it tells you something about the power. Uh, but I think it's a slightly incomplete solution uh, in the sense that, uh, for one thing, you have to decide what is the relevant violation of parallel trends. And it's sort of difficult, potentially, to do power analyses for all possible relevant violations of parallel trends. Uh, so uh, that makes it a little bit challenging. And then the second thing is that, well, you know, I'm not addressing these issues with pretesting, uh, you know, selecting the data where I pass the pretest. Uh, and this also doesn't tell me anything about what I should do if there is a significant violation of parallel trends. You know, I, I find that the, the pre-trends are statistically significantly different from zero. Uh, you know, it's great. I was powered to detect it and I did, but then I don't know what to do. Uh, and so uh, I think kind of, to me, the more satisfactory approach uh, is what I'm going to describe to you next, uh, which uh, is uh, sort of developed in my uh, forthcoming recent paper with uh, Ashish Rambachan. Uh, and uh, is uh, sort of implementable uh, using the honesty ID package uh, in R and Stata, uh, which uh, intuitively what it tries to do is it tries to uh, sort of impose some of the intuition motivating pretrans testing, but kind of avoiding the need to just statistically uh, test the pretreatment test uh, pretreatment trends. Um, so what I'm going to do next is uh, kind of tell you uh, how that works and show you an example, uh, and then uh, the coding exercise uh, that you'll do after this lecture. I uh, will uh, show you uh, how you can do this uh, in practice. Uh, let me just stop here and see. Uh, Rajesh says that Honesty Ideas is a super cool name. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, the paper was titled An Honest Approach to Parallel Trends. Um, so it, it, things kind of matched up. Uh, Unfortunately, I guess Rajesh was not our referee. Some of our referees didn't really like the, the phrase honest in the title. So it became a more credible approach to parallel trends since the name of the package did not quite match up with uh, the uh, name of the paper in the end. Um, so uh, I'm glad Rajesh likes the name of the package. Um, actually, uh, let me just, uh, I, I see a question here from Demetria. So, Demetria says, if we reject the pre-trends test, isn't synthetic control also a viable alternative? Um, I guess uh, I think that that is, uh, uh, that is a good question. And uh, I think more broadly, uh, if you reject parallel trends or parallel pre-trends for some specification, be that you know, difference in differences, but really it's not just difference in differences. Usually there's an array of specifications that you can use, right? So you might reject parallel trends for uh, you know, just treatment versus control, but then you could think about doing synthetic control, but you could also think about running a difference, difference, a different difference in difference of specification, say where you add in some control variables or you restrict your uh, control group to some particular subset, or you add in, you know, a time trend or something like that. So there's always some new specification that one can go to and then test again. Um, and you know, that may be warranted to change to a different specification, but then we get even more into these issues related to pretesting. So think about the example, I have 10 different specifications that I can run. Uh, if in fact, they're all exactly the same, like none of those controls really matter, parallel trends is just violated in, in all of them in the population. But if I choose the one where things look really good, then I'm now kind of selecting on the noise in that specification. And so that can lead to sort of a, an almost supercharged version of the pretest bias that I show you in the one specification where like now I'm kind of doing this. It's not that I'm like selecting studies where parallel trends looks good, but I'm selecting specifications where parallel trends looks good. Uh, and so there's something that's reasonable about kind of choosing the designs where it looks good, but then there are kind of limits of how well we can do that because if we're looking over lots of models and finding the one that looks the best, you know, it could be that that happens to be the best specification, but it also could be that that's the one that has the most noise so that we just don't detect the violation of parallel trends. And so uh, they're kind of 
statistical limits on how much we can really learn the right model from the data and we actually have noise in the data. Yeah, so an anonymous attendee asks, if power is inadequate, should we give up or should we proceed and transparently describe caveats? Um, so what I'm about to describe, I think, is an approach that lets you proceed uh, and sort of allows you to summarize in some sense what I need to assume, what the caveats are in order to, say, preserve a significant uh, test. So that's, I think, a great question and one that sort of nicely transitions uh, into what I'm about to talk about. Uh, let me just answer one other question from uh, Kaibal Yapati, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, sort of asked for synthetic control, are there pretrends? How do we test for pretrends? So in synthetic control, people look at what's called pretreatment fit, um, but uh, which is something sort of similar to uh, pretrends in the sense is it did the synthetic control group look like the, the treated group before the treatment. Uh, a thing to keep in mind though with synthetic control is that the synthetic control is essentially chosen so that the group prior to the treatment looks similar to uh, the, the treated group, right? You're choosing the weights so that they look similar. Uh, and so in some sense, by construction, uh, the treated group and the control groups should look, in sim uh, look, should look similar to each other in periods that are used to train the synthetic control. And so a good practice with synthetic control that I think is not always uh, done is to sort of create the synthetic control group using some subset of your pretreatment data uh, and then test war. Uh, so, so the, the group should be mechanically the same in uh, kind of that uh, sample because you chose the weight so that the groups would look the same, but then you should hold out some of your pretreatment data to test were they similar uh, in periods where they weren't sort of trained uh, so that the groups look similar. Um, so there are versions of things that look kind of like pretrends that you can do with synthetic controls, but you have to be careful about the fact uh, that you're kind of choosing the weight so that they look similar, at least in some of the periods. And so it's kind of more informative to look at the analog to pretrends in periods that sort of weren't used to determine uh, the uh, synthetic control weights. All right. Um, so uh, let me just uh, push on a little bit and, and describe to you a little bit more uh, what we do in this uh, a more credible approach to parallel trends paper, uh, which is trying to address some of these issues about, you know, power might be low against violations of parallel trends, but also we may want to be able to say something, even if the, the pretrends are significant, uh, it's going to sort of try and deal with those issues by imposing some of the intuition behind pretrends testing, uh, but not sort of officially running a test. And so it'll allow you to say a little bit more about what assumptions we have to make ex ante uh, in order for a particular conclusion to hold up. So uh, to give you some intuition before I get into any of the math, uh, I think kind of the intuition that we had motivating pretrends testing is that if I know knew about the true pretrends in the population, that would be informative about the counterfactual post-treatment trends, right? So if I knew in the population, these groups were exactly parallel for a hundred periods beforehand, uh, I would think that's probably pretty informative that they were be likely to be parallel afterwards if the treatment hadn't occurred, at least if there weren't, say, uh, some uh, confounding policy changes that happened at exactly the same time or some uh, you know, new macroeconomic event that was, that was never seen before, I would be fairly confident that if all of the pretrends were very close to zero in the population, that the post-treatment counterfactual trends would have also been close to zero. At the same time, if I knew the population pretrends were very different from zero, I would probably think it's plausible that the counterfactual post-treatment trends would also be uh, different from each other. So there could be substantial violations of parallel trends. Uh, and so the intuition is that uh, pre-trends are informative about counterfactual post-treatment difference in trends. Uh, and so instead of testing are the pre-trends zero, what we're gonna do is we're gonna formalize this by imposing an assumption that says, if I knew the true pre-treatment difference in trends, the counterfactual post-treatment difference in trends couldn't be too different from that pretrend. Uh, I'll be more precise about different ways I can formalize. It can't be too different, but we could think about sort of uh, this in two different ways. One is too different can mean that the magnitude of the post-treatment difference in trends can't be too different from the magnitudes of the pretreatment difference in trends. A second way I can think about that is 
you know, kind of if I think about fitting a line through the pretreatment difference in trends, that can't be too far off from uh, the post-treatment difference in trends. So those are two of the ways I'll talk a little bit more later about how we can think about two different. But we're, what we're going to impose basically is we're going to say if we knew stuff in the population, we knew that the pretreatment difference in trends, that would allow us to put some bounds on what the post-treatment counterfactual difference in trends could look like, where kind of if the true pretreatment difference in trends are very small, we're going to say that the counterfactual post-treatment difference in trends would have been very small. If the uh, true pretreatment difference in trends were very large, then we could say that you know there could be large violations of parallel trends in the in the post-treatment period. All right. And so if I impose those restrictions that the true pretreatment difference in trends and post-treatment difference in trends are not too far away from each other, then if I had data on the full population, I can impose some bounds on, on what the treatment effect is. Uh, and then since I have estimates, I can construct confidence intervals that sort of take into account the sampling uncertainty and get me confidence intervals that are uh, valid for the uh, average treatment effect in the, the post-treatment period uh, under this assumption that the counterfactual post-treatment difference in trends are not too different from the, the pretreatments. Uh, and so then this is going to enable me to do a form of sensitivity analysis where I can say things like how different would the counterfactual treatment, uh, counterfactual difference in trends in the post-treatment period have to have been from the pretrends to negate a particular conclusion. So I could say something like, you know, I would need uh, to allow for violations of parallel trends that are more than two times larger than the largest one in the pretreatment period to negate the conclusion of a significant effect. So this is a way of sort of formalizing kind of how big could the violation of parallel trends in the post-treatment period uh, be relative to uh, sort of what I saw in the pretreatment period uh, in order to uh, sort of negate a particular conclusion. Um, I'm going to just uh, push on a little bit here. Uh, I, I see there are a few questions, um, but I will, I will, um, one of them is how this differs from the, the power calculations approach. So hopefully that'll be clearer once I uh, kind of um, uh, describe the approach a little bit more. So uh, ask that question again in a few minutes if I don't get there. Uh, I see there are a few other questions um, um, about um, various things like synthetic control and other methods, uh, which I'll also try and talk about a little bit more uh, in, a, in a couple minutes. All right, um, so what I said is intuitively what we're gonna try and do is say, if I knew the true pretreatment difference in trends, then um, that would be informative about what the counterfactual post-treatment differences trends is. Uh, so let me show you mathematically how this works in the simple three period difference in differences model that we considered earlier. So uh, just to remind you, we're gonna have three periods, minus one, zero, and one, okay? And uh, the treatment is gonna occur in the last period for the treated units, and no one is going to be treated in period minus one zero. So we can look at the trends between period minus one and zero, um, and uh, we can uh, then think of that as being informative about what would have happened between zero and one if the treatment hadn't occurred. Right. Uh, and so for some notation, I'm going to uh, denote by delta one the violation of parallel trends, uh, this should say, in post treatment. Right, so what is delta one? Delta one is the trend between period zero and period one for the treated group if they hadn't been treated, right? So this is their counterfactual trend minus the uh, trend for the control group. So if parallel trends in the post treatment period holds, delta one is exactly zero, right? These counterfactual trends are the same. If delta one is say five, that means that if the treatment hadn't occurred, the trend for the treated group between period zero and period one would have been five larger for the treated group than the control group. So delta one, if we just look at our difference in differences estimated between period zero and period one, delta one is exactly the bias of the uh, difference in differences estimator. So if it's zero, difference in differences estimator is unbiased, but if it were five, the treated group would have increased by five more than the control group, then my difference in differences estimator is biased up by a, uh, a factor five, uh, by a, you know five units. Uh, so delta one, is how biased I am for 
uh, the average treatment effect on the treated uh, in uh, the final period. All right, so if I knew delta one, life would be good. I could just subtract delta one from my estimator and I would get an unbiased estimator. So if I knew delta one, I would be done. But unfortunately, I don't know what delta one is, right? Because it has this first term in it is a counterfactual term. Right? It's what would have happened to the treated group if they hadn't been treated. Of course, I don't know what that is, right? So um, uh, I can't learn that from the data. So I, I don't know directly from the data what my delta one is. It involves counterfactual quantities, okay? And so I don't know delta one. I don't know what the bias of my estimator is, but the beauty of the difference in differences design, which we talked about earlier, this is kind of what motivated uh, pre-trans testing to begin with, is that I can figure out a uh, sort of pretreatment analog to uh, delta one, which is what I'll call delta minus one. This is the difference in trends between period minus one and period zero. Okay, so uh, you'll notice here I have period minus one first, right? So I take minus one minus zero as opposed to zero minus minus one. Uh, I'm doing it that way just so it you know, matches up with kind of the event study plots that people usually plot. Right, so in a typical event study plot, it looks something maybe like this, right? So this pretreatment coefficient on the left here, that's period minus one minus period zero. Okay, so I'm, I'm defining delta minus one here just to sort of match up uh, with the way people usually make event study plots, All right? And so what's delta minus one? It's the difference in trends in the Y zero for the treated group between period minus one and period zero relative to the, the same difference for the control group. But the beauty here is that this first term here is actually observed, right? Because under the no anticipation assumption, I see the Y zeros for the treated group before they were treated. So I see this term. And then of course I see the Y zeros for the control group. So I see this term. So uh, ignoring sampling uncertainty, Delta minus one is something uh, that we can learn from the data, okay? So if I had data on the full population, I could learn Delta minus one, that's the pretreatment difference in trends, all right? So what I really care about is the post-treatment counterfactual difference in trends, delta one. What I can estimate from the data is delta minus one. And so the typical approach is what I do is I statistically test is delta minus one zero. And I use the results of that test to inform my thinking about how, uh, whether delta one is likely to be non-zero or not. But we talked about some issues with that approach like low power uh, and distortions from pretense testing so on and so forth. Uh, what instead I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and formalize this intuition, which is that delta minus one is informative about delta one. So if you told me delta minus one, that would teach me something about delta one. That is, if you told me how different were these groups prior to the treatment, how different were their trends, that would tell me something about how different they would have been in between period zero and period one if the treatment hadn't occurred. So instead of testing is delta minus one zero, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to impose something about the relationship between delta one and delta minus one. I'm going to say that if I knew, say, that delta minus one was small, I would be willing to assume that delta one is also small. Or if I knew that delta minus one was large, then I would be willing to allow for delta one to be large. Uh, so let me just uh, pause here uh, and uh, look at uh, a couple of the uh, uh, questions. Um, so uh, an anonymous user asks, how can you identify the counterfactual trends? Um, so here, the counterfactual is delta one, right? Uh, that's what would have happened if the treatment hadn't occurred post-treatment. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm in a, what's called partially identify, which means uh, be able to bound that counterfactual difference in trends by imposing some assumptions that allow me to learn about delta one, the counterfactual difference in trends from delta minus one, the population pretrend. So it's exactly this idea that I'm gonna restrict the possible values of delta one given delta minus one, that's gonna allow me to say something about the counterfactual, which I can't directly learn from the data. Right, so that's a great question. Uh, Rajesh asks, when's the next break? Um, so uh, I'm gonna try and finish these slides in roughly the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so. Uh, and then we'll have the coding exercise, but that's gonna be kind of self-directed so you can uh, sort of take a break at the beginning of that. 
Um, uh, another uh, anonymous attendee asks, um, uh, can this be used in the case of a continuous uh, treatment variable? Um, so uh, let me focus here on the um, uh, case of binary, uh, but then uh, I'll talk at the end a little bit about how uh, basically this approach is uh, can work in any case where you have some pretrend estimate uh, that you think is informative of the bias of a post-treatment estimate. Uh, and so then in some sense, uh, as long as you're willing to bound the bias of your post-treatment coefficients with some function of the pre-treatment coefficients, you can use this regardless of whether those coefficients come from, say, an, you know, a binary diff and diff or some continuous version or something like that. Um, so this approach will be uh, very general, but I think it's uh, easiest to first understand it in the simplest case with binary treatment before you sort of think about how we uh, can generalize this. All right, so I think uh, I see there are a few other great questions, uh, but uh, uh, for the moment, I'm gonna uh, push on a little bit. Okay, so uh, just as a reminder, I said, what we're gonna try and do is we're gonna impose some restrictions on how big can Delta one be, counterfactual difference in trends. If you knew Delta minus one, the true pretreatment difference in trends, okay? So uh, one way you can do this uh, is you can just bound the magnitudes. So in this simple example, where I only have uh, delta one and delta minus one, I might say that the magnitude of delta one, the possible violation of parallel trends in the post-treatment period is uh, less than or equal to some constants, I'll call M bar times the magnitude of delta minus one. So if I set M bar equal to zero, oh, sorry, if I set M bar equal to one, then this says magnitude of counterfactual diff and trends is less than or equal to the magnitude of the pretrial. Right. So delta one m bar equals one says there can be some violations of parallel trends in the post-treatment period if there were violations of parallel trends in the pretreatment period, which seems reasonable, but the magnitude of them can't be different, right? So or can't be larger, right? So I can say, you know, there could have been some violation of parallel trends, but I'm willing to say that the violation of parallel trends in the post-treatment period is no larger than the magnitude uh, I saw in the pre-treatment period. If I set M bar equal two, I can say there can be even larger violations in the post-treatment period than there were in the pre-treatment period, uh, but uh, they're uh, sort of bounded by, uh, they can't be more than two times as large. Uh, I should note here that here I have just delta one and delta minus one, but often I have not just delta minus one, but delta minus two, minus three, minus four, and so on, right? I have multiple pre-treatment estimates like, you know, we saw in the uh, Medicaid example, they had, I think, six periods prior to the treatment. So uh, this extends uh, very easily. Uh, so what I'll use in the uh, application that I'm going to show you uh, in just a few minutes uh, is I'm going to assume that the magnitude of delta one is less than or equal to the or some uh, m bar times the max violation. So I'm going to say there can be some violations of parallel trends in the post-treatment period, but they can't be more than some constant times the biggest violation that I'd seen before. Right? So that's one way that we can sort of say, how do we learn about the magnitude of delta one given, or how do we learn about the value of delta one, the post-treatment violation of parallel trends, given the pretrends that I observe? And one way, which I just talked about, is to say that we're going to say that they can't be too much larger in magnitude. So, you know, they can't be larger than the max that I saw before, or larger than two times the max that I saw before, and so on. Uh, a second way that we can think about uh, kind of extrapolating the, the uh, pretreatment difference in trends to the post-treatment periods uh, is, you know, I think a natural thing for us as economists, we love linear regression, right? So if I showed you some points beforehand, right, I showed you my event study plot where all I saw was everything to the, to the left of zero, right? So I saw, I told you, Delta minus one, the difference in trends at period, or the difference between the groups at period minus one uh, was delta minus one. Uh, and then I've normalized the difference at, at zero to zero, right? So if I told you the treated group was increasing with the slope delta minus one relative to the control group, a seemingly natural thing to do 
is uh, to extrapolate this line. So to continue along this blue dotted line and to say that, you know, if this uh, treatment hadn't occurred, I could just continue this extrapolation and then I would figure out that the difference in trends between period zero and period one would be uh, the extrapolation of this line, which in this case turns out to be minus delta minus one, right? opposite sign. I just continue drawing the line, right? And in fact, people sometimes run specifications where they, if they're worried about violations of parallel trends, they control uh, linearly, they allow for a group specific linear trend. Uh, in the simplest case, this is equivalent to saying, uh, or the validity of that approach is equivalent to saying that this extrapolation is exactly right, right? So if I extrapolate the pretrend, uh, I get exactly the counterfactual post-treatment difference in trends. So this blue dotted line gets me to exactly the right place. But of course, in practice, we often don't know if linearity is exactly right. So it could be that, you know, there's a difference in trends that sort of, you know, the slope increases over time. Uh, and so this linear extrapolation may not be exactly right. Uh, and so in uh, the paper with Ashesh, we think about relaxations of this linearity assumption where we say, you know, the linear extrapolation may not be right, but hopefully it's not too bad. And so what I show here is we're gonna formalize, it's not too bad by saying that it's off by no more than some constant M. So instead of saying that this dotted extrapolation is exactly right, I'm gonna say that this dotted extrapolation is approximately right by saying that it's actually within this uh, blue wedge, right? So it's between, the extrapolation minus M and the extrapolation plus M. So I'm allowing for the linear extrapolation not to be exactly right, but I'm saying it's not gonna to be too far off in the sense that it's not gonna be off by more than this constant. Uh, someone tells me, yes, the, the battery is draining to 26%, but I think we, we should only have like a 10 to 15% more uh, slides on the iPad, uh, 10 to 15 more minutes on the iPad. So hopefully we, sh we should survive uh, the battery, but thank you very much for the, the heads up there. Um, let me see if there. Uh, there are a lot of great questions here, but I think maybe slightly uh, off topic of where I'm, I'm going right now. So I think I'm gonna push on a, just a little bit, um, but. Uh, there are uh, there should be time hopefully at the end uh, for uh, some more uh, Q and A. Okay. So uh, I'd like to give you an example of how this works, and then uh, when you do the coding exercise, uh, you'll see a, a second example of how this works. Um, so um, the example I want to show you uh, is uh, from a uh, paper uh, by Benzardi and Carloni. Uh, Benzardi and Carloni are in interested in the incidence of a cut in the value added tax on restaurants in France. Uh, so uh, for those of you who are uh, not glued to the, the cost of restaurant going to a restaurant in France, uh, France reduced the value added tax on restaurants uh, from about 20% to 6% in uh, July of 2009, uh, but they held the, the VAT constant on uh, a variety of other industries. And so what Benzarni and Carloni are doing is they're gonna use a simple difference in differences design comparing uh, outcomes for restaurants to outcomes for a control group of market services firms uh, whose VAT was not changed during this time period. Uh, and one of their key outcomes is, is firm profits. So they're gonna look at, at uh, sort of what are the trends in profits for restaurants after this reform relative to trends in profits for these other firms who weren't affected by the stat change. Okay. Oh, sorry, I think. Oh yeah, sorry. This slide is out of order. Ah, okay. I'm I apologize. I um I'm gonna I'm just writing myself a note here to uh, fix the ordering of the slides when we uh, when I before I post these. Uh, so I apologize. So uh, I started telling you guys about an empirical application, but let me first just finish telling you about um, the uh, sort of what we do in the paper from a theoretical perspective. Uh, so uh, sorry about that, uh, going slightly out of order. So uh, let me just uh, take uh, go one slide back uh, to tell you just a little bit more about what we do in the paper. So. What I told you is 
uh, what we'd like to do is uh, we are going to say that if I knew the true pretreatment difference in trends, I could do some form of bounding to figure out something about the counterfactual post-treatment difference in trends. All right, so I'm going to impose something like, say, the magnitude of delta one, the counterfactual post-treatment difference in trends is uh, no more than some multiple of uh, the uh, largest pretreatment difference in trends. So if I knew everything in the population, I knew the true pretreatment difference in trends, then uh, what I could do is I could just know, I could bound my bias in the uh, post-treatment period and I could get a, a balance on what the true treatment effect is using that bound on the bias and my estimates. Um, but of course, in practice, part of the issue is that we have statistical noise in our estimates. So uh, we don't actually know what the true pretreatment difference in trends is, right? We don't know. So here I have delta pre, uh, which is sort of the more general notation for the pretreatment difference in trends. In our three period example, this was just delta minus one, right? The difference in trends between our two pretreatment periods. I don't actually know delta minus one. I just have some estimate of it, uh, say beta hat minus one, or more generally, I have some vector of estimates for the pretreatment coefficients that I might call beta hat pre. All right, so there are two issues here. The first issue is that if I told you what the true pretreatment difference in trends is, I wouldn't know exactly what the counterfactual post-treatment difference in trends would have been, but I might be willing to impose some assumptions like what I just talked about that says that the post-treatment difference in trends would have been similar to the pretreatment difference in trends. So there's one source of uncertainty of like, even if I knew everything for the population, how do I extrapolate the pretrends to the post-treatment period? Uh, we talked about assumptions that allow us to say something about the counterfactual post-treatment difference in trends if we knew the true pretreatment difference in trends. Uh, but then there's a second issue, which is that I don't actually know the true pretreatment difference in trends. I only have some estimate beta hat uh, of this population quantity, uh, which I called delta, delta minus one or delta pre. All right. And so uh, in the paper, we show how one can construct confidence intervals that takes into account the statistical uncertainty. Uh, and so this has the feature that the robust confidence intervals tend to be wider, the larger are the confidence intervals on the pretrends. So intuitively, if I'm uncertain about the magnitude of delta minus one, then my confidence intervals should be larger for the treatment effect because I'm more uncertain about what the bias is, right? If my confidence interval is very large on the pretrends, then, and I say that, post-treatment difference in trends can't be larger than the pretrends, then I'm very uncertain about how big the pretrends are. So I'm also very uncertain about how big the counterfactual violations of parallel trends could be, All right? And so these confidence intervals that take into account the fact that I've only noisily estimated um, the pretrends have what I think is the intuitive feature that the more unsure I am about what the pretrends are, the noisier are my pretrends estimates, the larger my confidence intervals are gonna be. Uh, so that seems like an intuitive property that I shouldn't have to point out, but I think it's worth pointing out because this contrasts with kind of a weird feature of pretrends tests, where if all I'm looking at is, are my pretrends significantly different from zero, it actually kind of helps me to have large confidence intervals. If my confidence intervals in the pre-period are really large, then it's very hard for me to reject that uh, the null hypothesis that they were zero. So the usual approach kind of has this very weird feature that the more uncertain I am about the pretrends, actually, the more likely am I to sort of pass the usual test. So I think uh, this approach that sort of says we're going to bound the magnitude of the post-treatment violations by the true magnitude of the, the pretreatment violations, and then we're going to account for uncertainty in our estimates of the pretrends, uh, it sort of restores what I think is the natural uh, sort of comparative static, where the more uncertain I am about what the pretrends are, uh, the larger my confidence intervals are going to be. And conversely, if I have very precise estimates of the pretrends, my confidence intervals are going to shrink. Whereas in contrast, the usual approach, if I have very precise estimates, I may be more likely to actually reject parallel trends. And so I'm sort of going to stop myself from analyzing the design in the case where I actually know more rather than when I know less. All right. So uh, that's kind of, that closes the loop on sort of the theory of what we do. We sort of impose these restrictions. If I knew the truth in the pre-period, 
I say that would be informative about what would have happened in the counterfactual in the post period. And then I account for the estimation uncertainty where I'm going to be sort of more uncertain about what could have happened in the post treatment period, the less certain I am about what happened in the pre treatment period. Right. And so, with that in mind, I can now go back to this Benzardi and Carloni example. So, recall in Benzardi and Carloni, they have this reduction in the value added tax on restaurants in France that occurred in 2009. They're going to compare trends in profits for restaurants relative to trends in profits for other market services firms. All right, and so here's the event study plot from Benzardi and Carloni, right? So they're gonna normalize the year before the change 2008 to zero. Uh, and so then to the right here, these are the post-treatment event study estimates. To the left, these are the pre-treatment event study estimates. Okay, and what you can see here is that uh, the uh, first three years of pretrends are sort of statistically indistinguishable from zero, but we do actually have a statistically significant pretrend coefficient in 2007. So the trends between 2007 and 2008, the uh, sort of last two years before the return, uh, reform, were not exactly parallel. So the restaurants' profits sort of decreased faster uh, than uh, the uh, uh, profits for the uh, comparison group. So in principle uh, here, if you do the joint test also, we can reject that the trends were exactly parallel in all periods prior to the treatment. So we can reject exact parallel pretrends in this setting. But intuitively, if we kind of look at this plot, it does seem like things jump up, profits jump up in 2009 for the, you know, the first year after the reform for uh, restaurants relative to uh, the uh, comparison group. And this jump between 2008 and 2009 is larger in magnitude than anything that we'd seen in the pre-treatment period. So it's true, parallel trends appears to be violated here in 2007, although the jump between 2008 and 2009 seems to be larger than the violation and parallel trends that we saw between 2007 and 2008. So formally here, we can reject the test of exactly parallel pretrends, uh, but we think that probably we uh, should be able to say something in the sense that the estimated treatment effect seems to be large relative to the uh, magnitude of the violation that we saw before. Right? And so uh, we can kind of formalize this using that relative magnitudes restriction that I talked to you beforehand. So here, uh, I'm gonna show you a sensitivity analysis for um, the uh, effect in that first period after uh, the treatment, the effect in 2009. Uh, and so uh, what I have here is uh, in blue, I'm gonna show you the original confidence interval for 2009. This assumes that parallel trends hold ex exactly, okay? So if I thought parallel trends held exactly in the post-treatment period, this is that confidence interval uh, that I had uh, from for 2009. This is just this confidence interval that I have in blue here. Uh, and then what I'm gonna do uh, in uh, the remaining confidence intervals on this plot is I'm gonna allow for violations of parallel trends, but I'm gonna say that they can be no more than M bar times larger than the largest violation of parallel trends in uh, the uh, pretreatment period. So for example, if M bar is equal to one, then I'm saying that there can be a violation of parallel trends between 2008 and 2009, but it can't be larger than the largest violation of parallel trends in the population in any period uh, prior uh, to the treatment. And so, uh, and likewise, uh, the other things uh, here, I'm gonna allow MBAR to be 0 0.5. So that's gonna be more restrictive. It's gonna say there can be violations of parallel trends, but no more than half the largest one in the pre-period. Uh, and likewise, I can go up to say one and a half times or two times, all right? And so if I look, for example, at the uh, M bar equals one plot, that says that I'm gonna allow for violations of parallel trends, but they can be no larger than the largest one prior to the treatment. I see if I do that, I get this confidence interval. It's larger than the one that I got using OLS, but it still excludes zero, right? So I'm allowing for some violations of parallel trends. It's intuitive that that's gonna widen my confidence interval relative to assuming that parallel trends holds exactly, 
But that's a seemingly more plausible assumption because we did see some violations of parallel trends in the pretreatment period. So it seems more reasonable to say there can be some violations of parallel trends, but they can't be too large relative to the ones that we saw before. If I do that, I get this interval here at m bar equals one. If I say they can't be larger than the max in the pretreatment period, I get a larger interval there, but I can still reject zero there. Right? So I can still say there's a significant increase in profits, even allowing for parallel trends violations as large as the largest one that I saw in the pre-treatment period. And indeed, I can even get a significant effect if I allow them to be 50% larger than the ones uh, in the pre-treatment period. But if I go up to about allowing for them to be two times larger, then my confidence intervals start to uh, include zero. So uh, a useful thing to kind of summarize these results is to report what I call the breakdown value of M bar that's the smallest value of M bar such that I now uh, fail to reject some null hypothesis of interest. Say here, the null hypothesis that there's an increase in profits. So I can say here that the breakdown is, is just under two. So I can conclude that there's a positive effect on profits if I'm willing uh, or if I'm not willing to allow for violations of parallel trends that are more than two times larger than the largest one in the pre-treated period. Uh, and of course, I then have to evaluate is two times larger reasonable. Uh, and that's where kind of economics have to kind of come into the uh, equation. So uh, if you look back here, uh, our treatment occurred uh, in 2009. Uh, if you were paying attention to the global economy, you know that between 2008 and 2009, that was actually the onset of the, the global financial crisis. Uh, and so there were some things that uh, sort of pretty important that happened between 2008 and 2009. Uh, you know, this was the largest economic crisis uh, of, you know, roughly the last 70 years. Um, and so, uh, you know, it might be reasonable if we think that restaurants and other market services firms are uh, sort of exposed differently to economic shocks. You might think it's somewhat reasonable that there might be larger shocks at the time of this recession than there were in the four or five years beforehand when uh, the economy was a little bit more stable. Uh, and so it's not completely crazy to think that there might've been shocks that were differential to restaurants that were twice as large as what happened in the pre-treatment period. Uh, I'm sort of not really an expert in, in restaurants in France. So, you know, people who know more about this can say uh, more about it than, than I can, whether that's plausible or not. Uh, but I think the kind of the nice thing about uh, this type of approach is it allows us to sort of formalize uh, what types of violations of parallel trends uh, would there have to be in order for us to uh, sort of not reject particular conclusions. Uh, and so, uh, you know, here this plot allows you to kind of say, uh, you know, if the violations of parallel trends were the same as they were beforehand, everything's okay. Even if they're 50% larger, uh, you know, we have more uncertainty, but we can still reject a zero impact on, on profits. Uh, but, you know, if the shocks to restaurants in the Great Recession were twice as large as the largest one between, uh, you know, the, the pretreatment periods that we have, then we can no longer reject a, a zero impact on profits. Um, so I think the uh, sort of this type of sensitivity analysis is useful for kind of quantifying uh, the amount of violation of parallel trends that we can allow for uh, in order to, to, to reach particular conclusions. Uh, I see Monica asked, if we allow for violations, are we still identifying ADT? So we're still getting confidence intervals that are, are valid for the ADT if we're uh, sort of uh, the bounds that we impose on the violations of parallel trends are correct. Uh, and then uh, Sung Hoon asks a good question, which is if the pre period point estimates are nearly zero, but power is small, how would that affect the honest approach? In other words, is bias in pre period a function of both standard error and point estimates uh, or nearly determined by the, the point estimate? So uh, intuitively, uh, the uh, sort of magnitude of these uh, confidence intervals is roughly determined by kind of the upper bounds of my confidence intervals in the pre treatment period. So it's determined both by the magnitude of the point estimates, but also the uncertainty, right? So, so here, uh, this isn't literally true, but the, the, uh, it's approximately true based on how the econometrics work out that uh, the, the confidence interval is sort of when I allow M bar equal to one, since kind of uh, this is the sort of largest magnitude that my confidence intervals allow, this upper bound on 2007 is about 0.1. So, my confidence intervals using the honest DID approach 
are typically going to allow for violations of parallel trends in the post-treatment period if I use M bar equal to one of about 0 0.1, because that's sort of the largest magnitude of violation that I can't statistically reject in the pretreatment period. And so the, the confidence intervals here are going to kind of take into account not just the point estimates, but also the statistical uncertainty. And so uh, the kind of bounds will tend to be large if either uh, the point estimates of the pretrends are large or if the confidence intervals are really large. So I actually am very unsure about how large the pretrends are. Uh, and uh, it's probably worth noting here that sometimes in settings, people have many, many periods that are very short. And so the estimates for each pretreatment period are quite noisy. Uh, and so that can lead to large confidence intervals using the honesty ID approach. If you think things can't change that much across consecutive periods that are very short, one way to kind of shrink the confidence intervals in the honesty idea approach is to collapse your data to a more aggregated time period. Uh, and then your pretrends coefficients are not just say for like weekly data, but they're monthly or yearly data. Uh, so then those confidence intervals will be tighter uh, and the honesty ID bounds will also be tighter. Uh, that corresponds to a slightly different assumption, which kind of says that, you know, parallel trends at the yearly level can't be violated too much in the post-treatment period relative to the pretreatment period relative to the weekly level, but in some contexts where you have sort of very close observations, uh, it seems reasonable to sort of uh, impose uh, restrictions on a sort of larger time horizons and kind of collapsing to uh, smaller uh, uh, or sort of larger bins of periods. So you have fewer, but more precisely estimated pretrends. Uh, seems like a reasonable way to go and we'll give you, give you tighter bounds here. Uh, someone asks, is there an optimal M bar? Um, not really. I mean, the, the M bar sort of depends on the, the context, right? So, so if I had, uh, you know, a setting where I thought the post-treatment shocks were much, much larger than any shocks that I saw in the pretreatment period, then M bar should be large. Uh, if I have hundreds of pretreatment periods uh, and I think things are relatively stable over time, I may even be willing to impose an M bar less than one, which is to say the violation of the parallel trends in the, the post-treatment period could be no more than say 75% of the max violation in the pretreatment period. Um, so I, I think it's important to kind of take into account, what do I know about the economic setting, um, you know, about what things may lead to violations of parallel trends when I'm thinking about calibrating uh, these M bar. Uh, obviously, you know, the types of violations of parallel trends that could, ex could exist are context specific, um, but I think that this, um, this approach gives you uh, some sort of formal ways about sort of quantifying what types of violations of parallel trends could I, um, could I allow for. Um, someone asked, I, I know it says hybrid here. Um, so uh, I think you can sort of just think about this as a robust confidence interval. Uh, in the paper, we talk about a couple of different methods of computing these confidence intervals. Um, and so this is a kind of a mixture of, of two different methods called a hybrid, which is what we recommend. But um, since I'm not going to go into a lot of the details of the, the confidence interval construction, uh, you can sort of just think of this as a, a robust confidence interval. Um, someone asks uh, if is it done by bootstrap? Uh, it's not quite. Uh, and the reason is that um, these confidence intervals involve things like a max, which are not uh, differentiable functions. Uh, and so it turns out actually the bootstrap is, is not quite valid, but uh, this is relying on a different approach that's a little bit more complicated, but is, is valid for things uh, involving um, uh, non-differentiable functions like the max. Uh, and um, someone asked, is small, how do I interpret small m? So small n means that I sort of, or small breakdown m, I think is what the question about. Uh, if the breakdown m is small, that means that I have to be willing to restrict the post-treatment violations of parallel trends to be relatively small relative to the max violation in the pretreatment period. Um, so the, the larger is the breakdown value of m, uh, the larger I can be willing to sort of allow the, um, the post-treatment violations of parallel trends to be relative to the pretreatment violations and, and still uh, maintain a particular conclusion. Okay. Uh, I think I'm just gonna, um, I think this is my last slide here. So uh, we're a little bit over the time that I planned, but, that, but that's fine. So I'm gonna, uh, let me uh, sort of, uh, wrap up here. Um, so um, what uh, I've talked about so far uh, is how do we do this honesty ID approach in 
a kind of a simple setting where we sort of have our basic event study, non-staggered treatment timing, not really controlling for a lot of control variables, just diff and diff and what does everything mean? Um, but uh, the key idea here was kind of that we had a sum post stream and estimator beta hat post and it had some unknown bias, but we were willing to restrict the bias of that post stream and estimator using uh, our pre-treatment event study coefficients beta hat pre. So in the relative magnitudes approach that I just showed you, for example, we were willing to say that if I knew the true mean of, uh, or the expectation of beta hat pre, I knew the true beta pre in the population, that would allow me to give a bound on the bias of beta posts that say, you know, no more than two times the magnitude of the largest element of beta pre. So the key here was I have some estimate beta hat posts that I care about. I'm willing to restrict its magnitude uh, using beta hat pre. Um, in our example, the beta hat pre was just a simple pretreatment difference in differences, and the beta hat post was a simple post-treatment difference in differences. But the same idea works if I have any beta hat posts that I care about and I'm willing to bound its bias with some beta hat pre. All right. So as long as the beta hat post and beta hat pre are going to be asymptotically normally distributed, which you know, if I have a lot of data, is a reasonable approximation for a large number of econometric estimators, I can use the same type of bounding approach. Of course, the exact interpretation of the bounding approach depends on what the beta hat pre and beta hat post are. So I had to be say, able to say something that the bias of my post-treatment event study coefficient is related to the magnitude of my pre-treatment event study coefficients. But if I'm willing to restrict these magnitudes, then it doesn't really matter how the beta hat pre and the beta hat post are constructed. Uh, and so uh, this can work, for example, for uh, their new methods such as Callaway and Santana and Sen and Abraham for settings with uh, staggered treatment timing. Um, so those produce a beta hat pre and a beta hat post. If you're sort of willing to bound the post-treatment violations of parallel trends by some measure of the pre-treatment violations, uh, like you have in these event studies, then you can use this methodology. So there typically the beta hat post is some weighted average of comparisons of cohorts treated at different times, say one period or two periods or three periods after they were treated. The beta hat pre is analogous weighted averages uh, of these cohort comparisons in periods before they were treated. Uh, and so if you're willing to sort of bound the violation of parallel trends uh, sort of weighted across those cohorts by their pretreatment analogs, you can use the same thing. Uh, likewise, uh, you can use this with uh, event studies created using instrumental variables or uh, using flexible methods for covariate adjustment. Uh, I guess I don't have it on the slide here. Someone asked about things with continuous treatments. You know, there are methods for uh, difference and differences with continuous treatments uh, where people typically can use those to make event studies. So you can use that as well. And so then kind of the key assumption here would be uh, sort of the bias of my regression coefficient using the continuous measure of the treatment in the post-treatment period is bounded by sort of the magnitude of the, the pre-treatment coefficient on that uh, continuous treatment measure. Okay. Uh, so just one clarifying question I see. Uh, Nora asks, it seems like this method still assumes that the difference in pre-trends deltas are linear. Uh, so that's not quite right here, actually. So, so uh, uh, what I showed you so far is kind of this relative magnitudes approach, right, where I say that delta one is less, in the simple three-period case, I say delta one is less than or equal to in magnitude than m bar times delta minus one. So that doesn't uh, sort of uh, require that the difference in trends be linear. So maybe the, I can show this to you visually. So here I have, say, my delta minus one. Uh, if I extrapolated linearly, it would be here. But now here I'm saying that the violation in the, the post-treatment period can be as large as m bar times the violation in the pre-treatment period. So that sort of says that the the magnitude in the, the pretreatment period is sort of going to be bounded between here and here, right? Because I take basically this is the absolute value of delta minus one, right? And so then I'm going to say that the delta one has to be within 
this band here, which has is sort of corresponds with absolute value of delta minus one at the top and minus the absolute value of delta minus one at the bottom. Okay. Yeah, so uh, someone asked, uh, I think, a good question about packages. Um, which is, you know, sometimes packages are built for particular situations and then you're in a setting where it's uh, sort of, uh, it's not the one that the package was for and so it's a little bit hard to use. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to, to, to that uh, point. Um, I guess I would say here, one thing I like about our package is that you just have to input a beta hat and a sigma, right? So you have a coefficients and their, and their variance. And so basically anything that outputs an event study, which is the beta and a sigma, can kind of be plugged into this package. Um, so I think the good thing about it is it's relatively broad. Uh, I'm sure there's some scenarios where it's a little bit hard to use, um, but uh, I think generally people are, you know, have a lot of different ways of making event studies. And so uh, I think one advantage of this type of thing is that, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, a particular setup of panel data, non-panel data, so on and so forth. Sort of as long as you can output an event study, you can kind of do this sensitivity analysis on top of it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm sure there are some scenarios where the uh, you know plugging into the package becomes a little bit difficult. Uh, for some things, it's a little bit hard to get the variance covariance matrix. Um, but uh, I think the package is generally pretty uh, general, and and we we have a readme on the on the GitHub page of the package uh, with several examples. But um, I, I guess I should say if you if you're using the package and you're having trouble. Um, uh, where we try to be pretty responsive to the GitHub issues. Uh, so if you want to file an issue or a, a help question uh, on GitHub, uh, we will uh, try to, to respond as, as promptly as possible. Um, so uh, I think I'm just going to uh, kind of wrap up here. Um, so uh, to uh, summarize, uh, tests of pretrends are very intuitive tests of identifying assumptions, but they're sort of not a perfect solution, not a panacea. Uh, uh, we talked about several issues, the most prominent one, which I think are low power. So, you know, parallel trends may be violated, but we may not detest, detect it. Uh, and then we also talked about pretest bias. So we're looking at a selective sample of the data. Um, and then uh, we talked kind of uh, uh, primarily about the honesty idea approach in, in Ramachin and Roth that allows you to do some sensitivity analysis that instead of pretesting, you're going to sort of relate post-treatment violations of parallel trends to pretreatment violations. And you can sort of characterize how large could the post-treatment violations of parallel trends uh, need to be uh, in order to uh, violate uh, particular um, solutions. Uh, and uh, I mentioned at the end that these tools sort of play nicely with recent estimators uh, developed for heterogeneous treatment effects uh, and uh, other types of methods. Um, Actually, if you are quick in the coding exercise and, and you get to the end of the, the coding exercise, uh, then um, uh, there's a bonus question in there uh, using these methods uh, in conjunction with the Callaway and Santana estimator, uh, which is one of the most popular uh, recent tools for, for settings with heterogeneous treatment effects. Um, so uh, I'm gonna, uh, I think, stop here. I'm, I'm, I guess I'll call it a victory that I'm only about uh, 15 minutes behind schedule. Um, and so uh, what uh, I'd like to do now uh, is uh, give you guys uh, some time uh, to do uh, the uh, coding exercise. Uh, so it'll basically just be an application of the honest DID package uh, in uh, the Medicaid example. Um, I think uh, what I'll do is uh, uh, it's a, almost 1210 here. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, I'll give you guys 25 minutes to do that coding exercise uh, on your own, or at least start the coding exercise on your own. Um, and uh, we'll reconvene here at, at 12.35 uh, Eastern time. Uh, and then I'll do the uh, sort of remaining uh, 25 minutes that, that we have allocated. Uh, I'll try and take some questions uh, that people have in the Q&A and sort of a, an open office hours. Uh, and uh, so hopefully uh, I'll either get to your question or someone has a similar question uh, that we can uh, answer uh, in that time. Um, and uh, so uh, I know 25 minutes is a little bit short, 
uh, time to do the coding exercise, but hopefully uh, that'll get you started and kind of give you a feel for uh, what, uh, how you would implement this type of thing in practice. And uh, of course, all the materials are openly available online. So uh, if you don't finish in 25 minutes, you're uh, kind of free to uh, pick this up again uh, later uh, on your own time. Um, so thanks again for all the great questions uh, during this lecture. Uh, I will uh, pause here uh, and uh, I'll be back uh, at 1235 um, to uh, do the Q&A.